Okay, last time the three of us got back, got together, it was it proved to be a rather controversial episode. Today we've got Mike back. Mike joined us on our, I think it was episode 25, where we debated the merits of keeping or tearing down statues. Welcome, Mike. Hi. Greetings, everybody. And of course, Paul is also with me. Paul's our, uh, you know, you're you're no stranger to the podcast, Paul. You're an official co-host, so yeah, an unofficial co-host. Yeah, it's 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 a nice title, though, unofficial co-host. Unofficial yeah. or yeah. official? Well, sort of. However, you want to interpret it. You're officially a co-host. <laughs> okay, cool. Like it. So we've got a couple topics today, and one of them is going to be. I know, Paul, you were interested in hearing a little bit about my new job and what it's like to onboard amid the COVID-19 situation. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're also going to talk about an interesting news story that's going on in the Toronto right now that um, is pretty controversial. And we'll get into the details of that shortly. But uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we get started here? So, Paul, you wanted to know about me onboarding and COVID. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's... Uh an interesting topic because I'm sure a lot of people are pretty interested in that right now. Uh, with everything going on with COVID, I know that it's um, it's an interesting time to be looking for work, or or I guess looking to uh, to change careers or or just to you know change companies for whatever reason. But I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are, are a little bit hesitant with everything going on with with COVID. The uncertainty. Was, when you say that, you mean for looking for a job or starting a job or? Well, I think a bit of both. Um, those people that, that are needing new jobs um, or people that are would just be looking anyway, regardless of, of what's going on with COVID. Yeah. And I, I wonder if a lot of people have been hesitant in, you know, job searching because of what's going on with, with COVID. But I was interested in hearing about your story with starting a new job, because I know you've been there probably about a month, I would say. Yep. And yeah, these are strange times indeed, in that it's not your traditional onboarding, where you go into an office on your first day, and you get to have lunch with your manager or something like that. And yep, the new team. Yeah, meet and greet with the new team. So with most people's work lives, well, those certainly in office environments are now working virtually, uh, onboarding is looking very, very different. Yes. And I think that it would be nice for some of our listeners to listen to your experiences uh, because, yeah, I think a lot of people would be very interested to see how things have gone for you so far. Sure. Yeah, well, definitely it's it's a different kind of starting a new job experience than it would be. I mean, I've started new jobs before, and my my type of work is office work. So going into an office and seeing your coworkers, yeah, that's part of what I do. And in this case, no, I can't. I don't work. I don't go into... I haven't had a first day in the real office. I haven't been shown around, you know, where the photocopier is or the coffee room or lunch room that that's never happened everything i've done so far has all been done virtually through microsoft teams we use in our in our office or in our company and we've had client meetings where i've been introduced to people all done through microsoft teams so yes it is very different i think the one thing i can say is i'm glad i'm onboarding now and not back in like april when this whole thing first started mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But do you feel any kind of like a disconnect in any way? Does it seem almost surreal in that? Well, I think it really had the the true experience of what it's like to be at your new company. Yeah, a little bit. I think the good news is I know my my boss very well. And I've known her for years. And so having already a personal connection to her is is good. If I was just had never met her before, that might be a bit more challenging. But because I have a personal relationship already, and we've had a working relationship as well in the past, it's much easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know that a lot of people have been, I mentioned before, hesitant about looking for work right now. But I tell you, it seems like there's still lots of companies hiring right now. Um, in our well, industry, there I, is. In our industry, yes. I, I was just going to footnote that by saying, you know, I'm sort of looking at it from, well, we both work in the insurance industry. There still seems to be a lot of jobs out there. So... 
this really shouldn't be a time in which people should hold back or or, or you know decide to, to hesitate making a career advancement. Uh, well, I don't know. That might depend. I mean, if you've worked somewhere for 20 years and you mm-hmm. decide to move amid COVID, that, there's some risk around that. It is, yeah, yeah. No, but I think a lot of people are probably may not necessarily be looking at all just because of just the the notion that they don't want to make a move in in during covid times but you know i think there's still great opportunities and obviously if there's a right position there for you then you shouldn't hesitate to go for it Um, but as you said there's opportunities to start new positions and in in new companies and although things are obviously very different right now it doesn't mean that it's any less of, of an experience or any less of an opportunity for you to, to go to these companies now. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad to hear that your onboarding has been successful so far. Um, I think where I'm wonder- struggling the most part is not so much in the inability to connect the same way with people. It's actually more in just the whole working from home experience and where I'm set up. I've got a beautiful setup for my office, but I'm in a basement I don't see the outside. So there's a little bit of that going on for me, and which is something that's probably affecting a lot of people. Not You don't even have to just work out of your basement to feel the way I feel, but still the feeling of maybe, like even ergonomically, like my shoulder is absolutely killing me. My right shoulder, which I used for my mouse and for typing, it's really bothering me. And, you know, I don't have the ability to ask for some ergonomics person to come by from our logistics department to say, oh boy, look, the way you're set up is, of course your arm's hurting. You need to do this and this and you'll be much better off or we'll get you this piece of equipment. I'm my own IT guy. I'm on my own ergonomics Mm -hmm. guy. So that's really the biggest thing for me that's causing Mm -hmm. me frustration is just how I feel. So, And I've heard that from other people. They've said, oh my gosh, my whole body is aching right now because people have been working from home in, in not necessarily ideal environments. And I think yeah. I actually have an ideal environment. Like I, I've got a stand up desk, but there's something I'm not doing right that I need to figure out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you mentioned about, you know, your home office being in your basement, um, moving that upstairs where you have some natural light. Do you think that would make a difference? And I know it's sort of getting a little bit off topic from starting the new job, but it relates into the whole working from home concept and the adjustments that people have had to make over these last few months. Um, have you found that you have been productive working in the basement, or would you ideally like to have that office somewhere else? Yeah, ideally I'd like to have it somewhere else so that I at least had some ability to see the outside. But the challenge is my wife also works from home, so she's occupying the spare room. So that really leaves the kitchen as the other option, which I've actually brought the laptop up there and just done work from the kitchen just to change it up. And that's actually been helpful. Mike, you were going to say something? It's gone. Whatever it was. <laughs> oh, I think it was that I hadn't renewed my, um, my relationship with my uh, ergonomics advisor at home here. So my, you know, my back was, I was just about to, to call him up, to come up. And uh, then I realized, yes, I hadn't renewed my, uh, my relationship with him. So, I see. I'll just have to make do with the hurting back in my place, as I'm sure many of the listeners will have to. Well, and you're. I, think, I was going to say, I think our listeners must think we're all like 90 years old or something, boring, <laughs> arguing about our, uh, our aches and no, pains. Uh, well, unless I'm sure there are a few people in the insurance industry listening and they can relate with the whole calling yeah, up yeah. the uh, ergonomics uh, person to come by. Yeah. Mo- yeah. Most of us don't have the uh, luxury. At a, mm-hmm. I, it, I wouldn't consider it a luxury if you have it but it's a it's a nice thing to you have resources like that in your work right well it's they'd be different just like sure. everybody like for anybody on a line or whatnot uh, in a factory or an artist or whatever yeah i mean we're in canada so with the social network i'm sure you could find some sort of uh social framework i should have said uh medicine there'd be some way to find someone to help you no one's on auto dial speed dial to come up and look at my situation very quickly but i sure i could take pictures and then go and make an appointment and do that kind of thing sure. well it's, you yeah. you're and just to remind people just who hey been, did, you have the same option that i do so from your basement 
whatever you have the ability to do is what I have the ability to do. So whatever Canada but, offers in terms of uh, uh, medical. Uh, no, but just to remind people, okay, okay, so I mean, you work you work in the film industry, and my guess is that if you had a, an issue an arm problem that was bothering you because of a workplace situation, there would be a union rep or something you could get a hold of? Uh, it depends how you look at it. There's there's the whole, you, you have the right to refuse unsafe work, and that's anybody in Ontario, right? Mm -hmm. And Well, probably anybody in Canada. But um, it, they won't have someone on back and call to like zoom in to look at, like, something that's unusual so that's not right. real that's not a, that's not a um oh well, that's more of a, a chronic thing that will affect you over time it's not really a dangerous situation it, but it can create a an imbalance that's more something that we'd have to connect through a doctor or an ergo, like physio person on our own time and then t show a, a setup of what we do and they say oh okay well here's how we'll compensate for that yeah, and your job changes every day. I'm sure you're doing certain things some days and other things other days, whereas people like myself are, and Paul are kind of yeah. doing the same thing. Well, that, and that's why keyboard and we're that's why you guys have that, you know, in your in your companies because it is about doing the same thing again and again and again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas mine, it, it's not always that, but it can be for some departments. It's not for me. As a reminder, I do special effects in front of the camera so things that actually happen so they record it on whatever recording media so flames rain smoke fog destruction of some specific design type anything that they really film happening that's what my job is so there's a lot of variety to that you're right okay so amid covid in particular in Toronto, there's a number of different stories that are going on right now. One of them, in fact, is a, a controversy involving the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. It's apparently about to launch a partnership with Skip the Dishes, which is a, receiving a bit of heat by the Premier here in Ontario. And for those international listeners, we live in the province of Ontario, which is similar to a U.S. state in that uh, it's a state, and then in Toronto is based in the city, in the province of Ontario. So, as well, cases are spiking in Ontario. Another record-breaking number of cases. This morning, we're announced 1,924 cases, up from 1,859 cases yesterday, which was also a record. So, with all this going on, there was one particular story I wanted to highlight and that is the story of a restaurateur, restaurant owner, who's facing charges right now for defying COVID-19 lockdown rules. And these, so Toronto's gone into what they call a gray zone. And there are restrictions right now as things like restaurants are not allowed to be open for in-person dining, patio dining in the city of Toronto. All this is not allowed. The only thing that restaurants can do is offer takeout and so we have this restaurant owner who is facing some charges because he refuses to close his restaurant and i'm going to run this clip for for everyone so they can get a snapshot of what's going on and then we'll talk about this after Next to the Etobicoke restaurant that's become a hotbed of anti-lockdown sentiment. The business owner arrested this afternoon, led away by police officers. CTV's Beth McDonnell is live near Royal York and the Queensway with more. Beth. It's been a tense few days here and still tonight there are supporters for Adamson's Barbecue and police standing outside the restaurant even after the owner and one other man were arrested. In handcuffs, Toronto police take Adamson's barbecue owner Adam Skelly away from his business and into a cruiser. Supporters and police back for a third day after the restaurant served customers inside Tuesday and reopened again Wednesday, disregarding provincial lockdown laws to stop the spread of COVID-19. Around 6 this morning, the locks were changed under an overnight order made by Toronto Public Health. Police say Skelly later was given some leeway to access a rear compartment of the building when a situation unfolded. They're in the process of uh, him entering 
Uh, they broke through the drywall and entered the uh, restaurant proper. And then from the inside, broke out and damaged the locks that were put in place by the city. Police say Skelly has been arrested and faces one count of attempt to obstruct police, one count of mischief under, and one count of failing to comply with continued order under the reopening of Ontario Act. Police say the situation was dynamic and another man was taken into custody. He faces one count of obstruct police charge. He faces six counts of assaulting a police officer. Five of those counts involve spitting at an officer. Two counts of uttering a death threat and a one count of failing to comply with a continued order um, detention or, or 7.02 order under the reopening act. Officers stayed at the restaurant throughout the day. The city plans further action tonight to ensure people do not return to the building again. The city of Toronto uh, will be taking action this evening with respect to the facility and the building, securing that, boarding it up, uh, changing uh, the lock on the back door as well as uh, repairing the lock that was broken earlier today. Yesterday, Skelly was also charged under the Reopening Ontario Act, a charge that can lead to a cost of $100,000. Reporting live, I'm Beth Mack. So, so h hero or villain? Is that basically what we're asking here? Well, yeah, I, I guess there's a lot of controversy here. You've got a lot going on. You've got anti-maskers. You've got people that feel small businesses are being slighted because the the smaller businesses aren't able to open whereas larger companies like Costco are able to have people come into their stores and go shopping for things that independent business owners may be also selling but aren't allowed to be open yeah because and, they weren't they weren't designated essential services correct so i mean there's a lot going on in this story this guy has a bit of a checkered past as well. He's been operating a business license for, I think, four years now without, sorry, he's been operating without a business license for the last four years. So that's a whole thing in itself that potentially speaks to this person's character. But maybe as a backup to this, I asked, this came up, Mike, yesterday, you and I were chatting and you had some very, I think I was getting the sense you had some passionate thinking around this topic. Why don't you just tell us where, why you brought this up? Well, I, I had, uh, I, I don't know all the details of Adamson's barbecue. I've never been there. Uh, I don't know how many times. Uh, it does remind me sort of of the Paul, what was the guy's name? Paul Magder situation. If you remember first, back in the 80s, that, yeah, every Sunday yeah, he would open that. up and, um, you know, for I don't know how long, a decade, he would uh, accumulate these $25,000 fines for opening on Sundays. And essentially pushed Canada, you know, well, uh, Ontario anyway, pushed uh, Ontario into the fucking 21st century and allowed us to open stores on Sunday. And then uh, as soon as they're open, everyone's taking advantage of that and very happy that we can shop on Sunday. But had zero sympathy for the fact that this was the guy that sort of pushed that agenda forward for a decade and a half. Same with the guy who... Uh, I, I, do not didn't do any research on my opinion as right now but a guy and his wife were the spearhead pushing forward uh marijuana uh deregulations or at least making them legal uh, you know softening the regulations around them and uh once they uh they were the demons for f the 15 years they were trying to push that for but as soon as it was made legal of course all the uh ex-police chiefs and other people jumped right in with their ownership of pot licenses in stores and investments. These are the same people that were standing up telling the public how this was a, an evil to society, should be controlled, should be, uh, you know, shut down, and they were the first in line to uh, take advantage of the changing legal situation. I see this as a little the same. It's not exactly the same. Public safety is an issue. But uh, I am fr not 100% firmly, but uh, masks will, uh, they prevent some transmission, but not all of it. This whole situation is going to play out in slow motion, and the people who are going to get crushed by it are small businesses. And uh, a lot of people have no sympathy for that, it seems. 
I think the reason I bring up the I shouldn't have said anti maskers because the, the reason I did mention that was because a number of the people, including this Adam Skelly guy, were being marched out of the off the premises with without masks, not wearing masks. A lot of the people at the scene, you know, holding these signs up, weren't mer- wearing masks. So I do get an there's a bit of an element of that going on here as well as their fight for independent businesses, I also get a sense a lot of these guys seem to be in that. They're not wearing their masks, so they probably could be falling into that camp. Uh, You know, this is one of those situations, I think, where uh, it's like climate change. It's not my job to understand and do the science on climate change. It's not my job to understand and do the science on masks and whether they work or not. Our government has divisions of people that their job is to do this and then issue public uh, information that is in our best interest and we should follow it. What the problem with generally society and the reason I have an issue with this is that there is a huge backlash to questioning just saying, okay, I get it that I'm not the professional here, but your message, official department, has been very inconsistent. One day, do this. The next day, do something. And I know it's real time. They're saying right in that clip that this is a very, uh, what's the word they, what was the was verb? A fluid or situation. Adverb, a fluid situation. Right. Uh, nice. I guess that's an adjective. Uh, yeah. It's a fluid situation, we get it, but they have been jumping back and forth 180 degrees in some of the things that we've been told. I mean, this is months later now, we're firmly in the camp of everybody who must wear a mask. We do know that that's not going to stop transmission completely. It can't, it can't, but um, that's not really the issue here. It's that small businesses, uh, I don't see a lot of help from the government or any leadership as far as telling them. We know that this shutdown will probably cause you to go out of business, but here's how we're going to help. It's a lot of, it's better than the states where they've been waiting how long now? Like months. nine months for any type of package, but Paul, it's, Paul it's looks been like a while and they're not getting guidance. That's what, and there seems to be very little sympathy on the side of people who watch them being shut down and are like, I get it. They're not following the public orders. This could put other people in jeopardy. That's the long and short of it is that this, this, they, they're not scientists either. The people who are making this, uh, uh, protest. So they don't necessarily know that their actions won't cause harm, but the harm that it will certainly cause is that their business is probably going to go down along with thousands of other small businesses. And, uh, There doesn't seem to be a lot of compassion or empathy on the part of many people that are all about public health, rah, rah, rah. The same type of situation, I guarantee you, in Costco's and Walmart's with everybody around. I'm sorry, the two don't line up, and it's like, sell this person down the river, but this is okay. And there's if you if you raise a topic or a a objection, you're as I've seen listed in someone's comments on their Facebook, it's like, oh, where where all the neo Nazis meet to have their barbecue now? Like, you know what? Go f yourself, guys. Like, run your own business for a while. See what it feels like to have it disappear inside a few months, while right across the street, someone's just doing quite fine, picking up your slack. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. You have something there? Yeah, I just wanted to mention. I think for the benefit of our listeners, I just want to make sure that we truly understand what the actual issue here at stake is. Is that we should clarify that with Toronto being in sort of the, yeah, I guess it is in the lockdown zone, whatever the, the quote unquote gray zone is. So just to clarify that this business, they are allowed to be open, but only for takeout, takeout and delivery. That's right. So I think the issue here was that he, the restaurant owner was allowing people to dine indoors. I think we should make that that yes. that distinction there that it wasn't yep. so much the business was shut down. It's because he violated the you know the the bylaws that are now in force right now that states that within the city of Toronto, uh, patrons are not allowed to to sit indoors. So I think this is really what it was stemming from. Um, and to Mike's point about the inconsistency 
with the the various lockdowns and and the the jurisdictions in in which it is being applied. Um, I live in Durham region, which is on the east side of Toronto, and and we're sort of in a in a different colored zone. So restaurants are allowed to stay open and have um, have people dine inside up to a maximum of of ten people. Mm-hmm. If you go further out, then I think it's it, I think I believe it's the orange zone where it's like 50 people, you know, it really is based on, on your jurisdiction. Um, but as for what we talked about before, this these various um, restrictions and, and these criterias that have been placed in these various uh, zones or, or uh, segments of, of shutdown that have been applied th- all over the province, it, it seems to change almost every day. Um I can definitely understand the frustrations um, and the the concerns that that the small businesses have. This is their livelihood. And of course, they're going to be angry. Um, But when you were when you were playing that that audio tape there, the things that that jumped out at me was the sheer um, anger and and the rage that is surrounding this. Um, There was mentioned, you know, people spitting at police, uh, death threats are being uttered. Like we're getting to that point now where these restrictions are literally tearing us apart, you know, at, at what cost? So we, we've shuttered the, the restaurants. I, we don't really know if it's making any difference. According to the chief medical officer, they seem to think it is, but they don't really, they don't really know for sure. But, you know, here we are having this debate over whether this is right or wrong and, you know, people have become so so angry and frustrated over this. It's um, you know looking at at the at the television broadcasts of of the the protesters and you had mentioned the 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 anti masking movement has sort of rallied behind this guy. Um, it, it's 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 sort of a powder keg of of the frustrations that are are throughout the city. I, I'm sure that for every. Um, What's this guy's name? Adam Skelly. I'm sure there's thousands of other restaurant owners that are, are right behind him that want to do the exact same thing, but are afraid of, of what of what the, the legal consequences would be. Well, yeah, and I think this guy is kind of trying to be that guy. Um, the so the lightning rod, yeah. And he's, and you're right, Paul, you're right, Mike, you mentioned the, the, the fur guy, Paul Madsen, I think it was, who um, incidentally died last year. He was uh, he, he defied the whole Sunday shopping laws in Toronto just by continuing to open. And I think there's something about this Adam Skelly guy who is I don't know is he is he does he have the wherewithal to think he's that guy he's the crusader? Well, if you look at his GoFundMe page, I don't know if you had a chance to see. So a GoFundMe page was set up for this guy. Let yep. me first let me read the what his mandate is here. What what the GoFundMe page is saying? It says. Amidst the slough of politicians, media, and citizen fear mongers supporting irrational COVID public health orders that shut down small businesses while allowing corporate big box stores to re- remain open, one small business is standing up for the rights of the little guys like you and me to get out and earn a living too. And this guy has so far raised, this FundMe page, GoFundMe page, has so far raised $323,000 toward a a $350,000 goal for his legal defenses. I mean, there's a, let's see, it says there's 6,000 donors that contribute to this $323,000 that's been raised so far. Um, Yeah, so there's a lot of support for this guy. The same yeah, thing, would, going back to the Magder uh, comparison, is that back then there were exceptions just like there is now. So here's a guy basically looking at, back then, stores are allowed to open for what they consider uh, tourist areas. You know, gas stations, convenience stores, and other things were open on Sundays. Yet that first store uh, that Magder owned was not considered part of that. Yep. So once again, it's it, it comes down to a fairness issue. You watch someone making a decision that's more or less arbitrary like how do you know that people don't travel in for tourists to buy a fur coat like fur coats i wouldn't call that an essential like 
so maybe not a convenience store, but uh, tourism, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of thing that people would do when they're... Uh, so he was against it then, and this guy's against it now. It's like... But is it fair is is it fair to compare this guy to Magda Furs? Because no one is arguing that, you know, these COVID shutdowns are going to be permanent. We, we certainly hope that they're going to ease up at some point. <laughs> Hopefully, well, now that we got the vaccine on the way, fingers crossed. <laughs> permanent is, uh, uh, is not the argument. It's how long until their business is gone. Like, Paul, basically, if you did the math, let's assume any of these people, let's give them the uh, benefit of the doubt that they are following the numbers. And they literally looked at their books and said, well, I'm out of business in five weeks. And then this is moot. The entire investment, everything about it. Five weeks, done. You can, they can change the locks on the doors as many times as they want then. Uh, can I see how that might lead to someone taking actions that are a bit more, um, I don't know, extreme? Yeah, I can yeah, see it. I can have sympathy for it. I'm not saying I'd be rather eating ribs alongside them. I would not be. But... Uh, for some people, it's pretty permanent to see their businesses shut down or, or close because they can't keep them. That's pretty permanent for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, to use the other side of the same coin. So Costco apparently got a fine recently for being way over uh, uh, the limit of the amount of people that could be in the structure at the same time. Um, their fine might have been as high as $5,000. Like... Wow, for Costco, yeah, that's like bucket, one person's yeah. one person's order. Um, you know, and of course, if they yeah. want to make the public health example, let watch them jump down on this guy with both feet. And his actions are pretty despicable, though. I mean, the whole yes, I understand the Paul Mangder Ferd guy didn't like spit in a policeman's face when they came to serve him and say, "Hey, you're open on Sunday. Here's the fine." The the police are never at fault in this. All they do is enforce the rule that is existing. So I don't look mm -hmm. at police as being bad guys in this situation one yep. bit. No, um, it, it, that's a great point. No, it, it is unfair that the police get get tasked with the unenviable position of having to enforce this. But I guess what you're seeing from from Adamson's barbecue is sort of a, a probably a last ditch uh, rebellion from a lot of these small restaurants because Clark, you mentioned before about you know, with COVID and the small independent restaurants are, are the casualties of that. I believe I was reading an article, um, maybe a, a Toronto Life blog or something like that. And they listed all of the the independent restaurants that have been forced to close permanently wow. due to COVID over the last couple months. And it's, it's a many? long list. It's yeah. a very, very long list. And, it, and it's sad to read that. And more like, to there come. There's literally hundreds, hundreds of restaurants that are now shut down permanently. And well, many there's are... no guarantee who's going to make it past this one, by the way. Yeah, the the uh, Adamson's barbecues might go down to the glee of everyone who's like your super communist left liberal reading these things. And you might get your uh, Tibetan, uh, I don't know, yak noodle place going down as well. So you'll, you're going to cry in your own milk there or whatever they I don't even know what I'm saying, but there is it's it's not going to be distinctive uh, as far as like one side of political discourse or the other uh, that all the places that they support are going to be around. They're going to see their own places go down too. So here's a question: Do you think this is political, or do you think this uh -oh. these these restrictions are imposed by yeah, public health officials is... that are completely out of touch? Yep, because both. from from a politician standpoint. Obviously, it's I don't think they want to see these businesses being shut down either because you, these are voters. It uh, reflects poorly you know on them as well. Doug, Doug Ford, uh, I personally never really liked Doug Ford a hell of a lot. Uh, this is the best thing that's ever happened to him. It allows him to change the, uh, change the uh, focus of what a typical uh, premier's job would have been day to day to like being like Giuliani running around New York pointing at people. You got a mask on? Is that man okay? Get that guy a drink of water. 
good on you, Mr. Fireman. Like it, it, it's so hard to be criticized for being the public health, uh, f- you know, it, leader out there charging with a flag in one hand and you know looking like one of those propaganda posters from uh, World War Two with your the cuffs rolled up and you're charging into the battle, but. I'm not sure I still buy it. It's like the ebb and flow of what serves their purposes is what I see their actions mostly. Do you think some people use this as an excuse just to gather and cause trouble? Maybe. I don't know. Do I think that people can be morons? Yeah, for sure. You know, it's interesting. I was trying to find some information here about how many bars have closed down. And I didn't find any. There's a list here of all the bars that have closed down as of November. It doesn't give me a total, and I didn't want to count them. But just as an example, in July, a similar article came out that said 60 bars. Here's the list of 60 bars and restaurants that have closed. So this was back in July, three months after the pandemic started. I can only imagine what this number looks like now. Yeah. Well, consider this. Timing aside... Um, every one of these businesses would have been gearing up for the last six weeks to two months for the season that may make or break the chance that they'd stay in business, which is Christmas, do, do enough business to just possibly hold on by their fingernails until things open up enough so that they could have some breathing room. And so stocking up for Christmas, having the products there ready for people and then being forced to shut down. And then, of course, that I find slightly snide remark, well, this doesn't limit people from doing pickups or internet business. Like, get get out there and support local, right? So some local shop is going to have their internet portion of their business up and running to compete against the Amazon. Right. Like, how does, it, how does a little clothing store do that exactly? Yeah. Like, and, they, and they, it, they don't. They go out of business. There it's are companies like minus. Shopify, though, that can help with companies with that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I know, but the point is, if you don't have it up and running and, and ready to go now, and even if you do... And that costs money, too, to set that well, up, obviously. Well, off the top of your head, uh, Paul, where are you going to buy... Like, you want to buy... Your kids say, hey, uh, your kid, sorry, says, uh, here's what I want, Dad, for Christmas, and it's a book or a movie. Where are you getting it? Probably Walmart or Amazon or something like that. Right. It was, yeah. Would have there ever been a chance that you would have got it at a small place? local shop local I and know. i mean honestly yeah. i'm not it's not like i'm gonna bash you if you say no i get it i buy 80 percent of my stuff from amazon as well but yeah. that the choice now when really you could see how hard the small businesses were being hit to support them has yeah. largely disappeared it's, yeah and, it's difficult to say the least and with respect to the restaurants i think there's definitely has been a movement to try to support the local businesses. I know out here in, in Durham region, there's a Facebook page of people sort of um, putting in a, a plug for, for local businesses. Um, and actually, we, we've discovered quite a few um, local places that we, we try to, to provide our, our business to. Uh, that you didn't know about it, before. Yeah, I, that I didn't know about before, that I, I learned about them through this, this Facebook page. So there has been a lot of benefits um, but with but is the that whole enough? debate, is that enough to get you know? Okay, so well, you've discovered some new businesses out there, ma and pa type places. But okay, great, they're in the spotlight now a little bit. But is that going to be enough to keep them going? Yeah, to some I'm sure places, they'd rather maybe. have said, "Hey, yeah. fringe benefit of all this is more people know who we are, but we're still going to go out of business because our sales yeah. just weren't enough to make up for it." Well, it, it depends. If it's a takeout restaurant, they probably are doing extremely well. If they started uh, out for, as for dine-in restaurants, if they no, started out as not. one, but, but even then, now with like, um, it's there's so many people jumping in trying to create rules that are beneficial for them in this situation. Uh, you know, given the, we all have heard, I'm sure, even the, every listener has all heard about the small razor thin margins in restaurants. Yep. That's not going to change. In fact, it's getting worse all the time because fixed costs keep rising. Yeah. Yeah. And yet, people do not change their mindsets as quickly as fixed costs right. do. And you should also point out about those razor-thin margins, the whole debate over, like, the skip the dishes and all of those Well, that um, yeah, that's one of the things that, where I was going to say that 
that changes. We there's yeah. no, and it, the most public has no idea just how much of the payment they're making goes to that service provider. Yeah, because um, in some ways, skip the dishes, Uber Eats, it's really not allowing them or it's not really making that much profit for the restaurants it's enough to just kind of keep the lights on barely yeah this is a sensitive topic actually because we have a a friend of ours who owns a local place up the street and i'll I'll freely share the name it's aces place it's a nice bar all three of us have been to it it's a nice little spot very close to stumbling distance to our house (laughs) and i learned from him about what uber eats for example charges a 30 percent fee for delivery, and a 15% fee per order for pickup. Okay, so now this is, you've learned this secondhand? I'm reading it right now. Here it is on foodandwine.com. Uber Eats notes on its website it charges restaurants a 30% fee for delivery and a 15% fee per order for pickup. So 30% on what? Of of the food order. So So literally, the more I spend, uh, it just stays... Exactly relative. I think if you were to go to and buy a hundred dollars worth of food at Ace's place, that th- he would have to sh- shovel over thirty dollars of that one hundred to Uber Eats to to support mm-hmm. the fact that you're able to order through the Uber Eats platform and that the Uber Eats delivery service will take it to the customer's house. He's paying thirty percent for that privilege. And, and what I find is that depending on the restaurants, there's an Uber Eats or, or skip the dishes price, but then there's there's another price. You, you do actually pay more depending on the restaurant. Like there's a there's a second menu for the for the the skip the dishes app where you do pay a premium because the restaurants have to charge more for the food to compensate for that thirty percent. Are you saying so if for, it's a hundred dollars then they're gonna charge hundred and thirty yeah, sort of so thing? Yeah. So basically if if you pick it up yourself and pay cash, let's say an item would be you know, at ten dollars for a plate, whereas if you go on the on the Skip the Dishes app, that same item might be like twelve fifty or something like that. Right. So they right. have to charge more in order to compensate for that thirty percent. So for for me, for what what I've tried to do is that I will go and pick up the food directly because that way I know the money is going directly. Yeah to that restaurant they're not paying yeah, any you, overhead you you care paul most people don't give an that's f true. that's yeah. the thing and you got to go with the average person if you said hey by taking these 30 second extra mi- seconds of uh, effort you can actually make a difference in this business's like they'd be like nah <laughs> most people how many people listen to an ad on youtube when that little skip the ad comes up saying oh well this is the way they make their money. So I'll I'll sit and listen to the ad for 30 seconds so this guy can make his 0. .001 cent no. off me. It's like, nope, F it. Skip. People don't care. Unless they literally have a personal relationship. So this whole idea that we're helping Toronto businesses, you know what? You either help them or you don't. You don't make a selection like, oh, this one is okay, but that one's not. It's like, well, do you want to... I, this is... My main argument is... The government themselves has totally dropped the ball on communicating to businesses how they may get help by saying, I know you're sort of sacrificing yourselves. It's not really fair. The world isn't fair. But either communicating, sorry, no help for you. That's just the way this is. Like it or lump it. Or, hey, we're going to help you. And this is the way it's going to happen. Don't worry. Yeah, uh, I really not, feel for this very guy. Very little of that. I feel for all these independent restaurant owners. In I don't feel for his behavior. That's It's pretty disgusting. Yeah, no, but I he agree could have. that one, yeah. No, I, I, the then again, I also don't want to judge all, because putting, did they go to him for that for that message on uh, CTV or whatever? No, the police got to go up and say their bit, mm-hmm. and they're going to make it sound really like beneficial or suitable for their actions. They're not going to try and balance it and give that other guy. I'm sure there are ab- people who have interviewed him. So if well, you really care, you can find the other side to it. I think if the spokesperson, do you guys know that Aaron Franklin guy, Aaron Franklin barbecue guy? No, no. He's this famous barbecue guy. He's in the States. He's got a master class and he's a, done some cameos in movies. He owns a, a barbecue in, I think it's New Orleans. And it's world famous. He gets a line up down the street, but he's a super personable guy. He's guy. He's shown. He's been in movies, cameos. He's got a master class. I think ideally he would be the better sort of representative, like Paul Magder, who was 
you know, kind of a classy guy, at least in that he, he was, you know, honorable in a sense about how he represented himself. So I think the, yeah. the restaurant industry might prefer, but then again, has that, okay, let me you finish know that, that sentence restaurant, for a sec. Yeah. So okay. with the restaurant industry or the people that are looking out for this guy, would they prefer more of a neat and proper kind of person representing them? Or is this exactly in this day and age with the, the Trump era and the way things get mm-hmm. polarized now, is this exactly the kind of guy people want representing their interests? Unfortunately, well, yeah, some ways it is. Sometimes the loudest person gets the most media attention. And it's unfortunate that, yes, the, the way this guy handled it was, was, was not right. Um, but yeah, we, we, we are here obviously sympathizing with his position, just not his behavior. That's all. But the old man in a white apron, who's like this curator of amazing barbecue food, who's got a a nice demeanor, looks good on TV and is, is very polished. Is he the right guy for this? Would you support someone like that? I would. Yeah, probably. I don't know. It, it, it's not even, this doesn't seem to be a, it's funny, they jump on the restaurant association's opinions when it's, when it seems to suit the uh, the message that's going out here, which is the restaurant, they don't support this guy's message. They're not behind him. Uh, but do they all, do they all want help? Probably. Uh, I don't know how you would even do that. Like, what does that mean that I'm... See, here's the thing. Let's rewind a little bit. We're... The government's been giving out money left, right, and center. Uh, when the time comes to pay that bill, everyone's going to freak out, I have a feeling, because it's going to be taxes going up like you wouldn't believe. So, me personally was shut down. I was shut down in my job. I don't know. I think I got about 4000 bucks from the uh, government in payments. Yep. I am go- I guarantee you. I will tell you this now and I'm going to be back in 5 years after it's all been said and done. I am going to pay 100,000 bucks in taxes extra over the next 5 years to pay for that 4,000 bucks that I got. If it, there was a box that said, "Please don't take anything from me because I don't want I I'm going to go with the leave me the way I was. I'll I'll get through it myself." Yeah. And then, but when the tax bill comes, leave me out of it. I would have checked that box right away. I would have suffered through it, sold stuff as I needed, because the, it's going to be so disproportionate paying it back. You wait. Huge companies will get off the hook, and so I see this as a all the major corporations that are reaping their rewards. This almost seems like a side benefit. Almost, he couldn't have been planned better for them if he had tried. Well, they're all going to increase the size, their power. Internet companies, huge corporations like Walmart, like Amazon, mom and pop businesses that are going to go down, and they're not coming back fast. You see downtown cores that are eviscerated. I've been walking down strip malls where sixty percent of the the stores are uh, shuttered. You it, people think the sense that. When this ends, they're just going to start opening and things will go back to normal. I, I I hope that's the case, but I have a real foreboding feeling that this is not going to be the way it goes. Okay, Paul, bring your gent, your Mr. and Mrs. thing in. Let's do it in, we got two and a half minutes, so you got a minute and a half for us to do this segment. Go. Just a quick debate. My wife finds it irritating when she receives Christmas cards uh, addressed to Mr. and Mrs. P. Provis. I know that is somewhat of a generational thing um, in terms of how one addresses, um, you know, correspondence. But I guess from my, my wife's standpoint is that she views it as her identity is defined by, by her husband's name. Is this something that... Uh, you know, in, in terms of the whole debate here, I, it, it annoys her. And I'm just curious as to if other women feel that way. And this is where maybe having a, a be nice to have a, a woman's perspective chime in on this. And maybe we could, you know, revisit these types of, of debates further. But just want to 
I don't know, get your guys' opinion on on that. Uh, who who's sending you these cards? Is this like Pepperidge Farms? Uh, no. Uh, re- uh, remember to reorder the Yule log this year, Paul. Family, friends, and stuff like that. Um, okay. Typically, people of a of my my parents' generation, like it more. more yeah, older yeah, I people. think that's what it is. It's all it's the older generation. But I have. It's seen, okay. I have seen it's okay, it from Kelly. They're all get, they're all gonna die soon, Kelly. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I have, we have received letters from contemporaries addressed to Mr. and Mrs. P. Provis. Now, are, are, did hmm. they actually write it out, or was it those little? No, they wrote it out. Oh, it's, stickers it's, that you get from the uh, yeah. the war amps. Less <laughs> than a minute, guys. Yeah. Uh, so, because it's like, I don't know. It's, the fact that you get mail at all is cause for celebration, because that's that's gonna end. That's yeah. that's a good. Point. Another thing the millennials <laughs> have killed. Raise it! I, I'm raising metaphorical uh, old person's fist and shaking it at the millennials. I was going to say I haven't seen uh, an example of this because we don't get Christmas cards anymore. I mean, we might get two or three. And first, my opinion: this is just going to phase itself out. The older people get. You said there's some contemporaries doing it, but yeah, um, you just wait, Paul. The next one's coming is going to be Mister Mister He She It or otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the uh, the pronouns, yeah. <laughs> 